barbaric murder takes place in a schoolyard. It was a brutal, brutal crime. The violence to the body was, was horrific. Strange marks cover the victim's body, indications of a savage attack. Detectives try to find the killer. Fingerprints, teeth, even concrete are all painstakingly analyzed for clues. As the evidence unravels, it leads detectives into a maze of suspects and theories. I hit her. Then what happened? Didn't move. We were left with an uneasy feeling about this confession. The pressure is on the forensic team to find the truth. Because in this strange case, a confession is not enough. a.m. May 20th, 1990. Behind Grant Park High School in Winnipeg, Manitoba, a horrific crime is discovered. Shortly after the body is found, two forensic officers, Don Boulay and Carrie Armit, arrive at the crime scene. They too are shocked by what they find. Carrie Armit was responsible for gathering the forensic evidence at the crime scene. It wasn't a simple stabbing, shooting. The body had sustained uh, a number of uh, serious injuries. The victim is a middle-aged woman. It appears she was assaulted before she was killed. Her shirt has been pulled up over her head and her purse strap is wound around her neck. Forensic officer Don Boulay, Armit's partner in the identification unit, was responsible for photographing the crime scene. The victim was naked from the upper body down. The only thing she had on her lower body was her stockings. Uh, so it, it would appear that there's a, something of a sexual nature that had happened there as well. The savagery of the attack and the state of the victim's body convinces police that they are dealing with a vicious psychopath. The victim's head has been crushed beyond recognition with a 55-pound piece of concrete. Who would do such a thing, and why? The attack was so violent, blood had spattered up to 20 feet away from the body. Whoever uh, was present when the violence occurred to the body uh, would have received more uh, blood spray and, and tissue matter on them. The officers find a pair of black dress shoes and one white canvas slip-on. They are all the same size. While Officer Armit searches for clues, his partner, Don Boulay, makes a detailed record of the crime scene. The contents of the victim's purse litter the area. Might robbery have been a motive for the assault? The area around the body is covered with footprints. Could there have been more than one assailant? The crime scene was a mess. It's outside and uh, in the middle of a schoolyard. Uh, there were also footprints, tire impressions. There were cigarette butts and so on. I remember uh, as I'm photographing this scene, uh, and I, in fact, I may have made, even made comment to one of the other officers there uh, that uh, for all we know, this guy could be watching us because there are several apartment blocks in the area and uh, it was just uh, an odd feeling at that time. Some 200 feet away from the crime scene there's an open parking lot. Scouring the area for any clues that might shed light on the murder, Officer Armit finds a grocery list and a five dollar bill. Money generally doesn't uh doesn't appear everywhere in, in school parking lots, with my experience. It is possible that uh, it may have been blown some distance. And of course, at that point in an investigation, you don't know what may or may not be relevant to the crime. 
The most relevant and vital clue they discover is the victim's identity. Her name is Shirley Andronowicz. She is a 42-year-old housewife married with children. Her home is only a few blocks away in a quiet suburban neighborhood. What was she doing out here in the middle of the night? May has been a dry month and the ground is hard, but the blows to Shirley's head are so violent that a two-inch depression remains when her body is taken away. The community was horrified seeing uh, that this woman was uh, um, an average, uh, I would call her a middle-aged, uh, middle-class woman, uh, brutalized and murdered uh, on a school grounds. While the forensic team combed the crime scene for clues, homicide detectives try to piece together what happened and identify potential suspects. Detective Sergeant Bob Marshall led the homicide investigation. This was a particularly difficult case. We had an outdoor scene, which is always difficult, never mind one that's uh, frequented by thousands of people on any given day. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it was, a, it was a crime that captured the attention of the city, in particular the neighborhood where it happened, just uh, by the horrific nature of it. The first 48 hours of a murder investigation are the most crucial to picking up a vital lead. Detective Ron Oliver was Marshall's partner in the homicide investigation. It's all an interview process. There's a lot of legwork involved. Our entire squad would have been working on interviewing numerous people. Uh, who would have either known, had knowledge of that particular evening. 85% of murders are committed by someone known to the victim. Hi, is your dad home? Dad? The police must now interview everyone who knew Shirley. The police are here. They start with her family. Yeah? Mr. Andronowicz. Yeah? What's up? I'd like to talk to you, sir. Do you have a minute? Uh, yeah. You know, it's a good thing you're here. My, uh, my wife didn't come home last night. Could we come in, please? Yeah, sure. Ed and Shirley Andronowicz had been married for 19 years. They had three daughters. Ed told the police that he and his wife had gone for drinks the night before at the Grant Hotel. Uh, we went to the Grant around 8 o'clock. You remember who was there? Randy Sloan, Ron Sutherland, Rick St. Germain, they were all there. Hey, 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 with the music, eh? Oh, that's all right. I love it. I love the music. The Grant is near Ed and Shirley's home. They are regulars here. Shirley likes dancing and flirting. <laughs> That's nice. Ed tells police he'd been drinking long before they went out that good. night. So good. Where you been all my life? I'm tired. Let's go. Oh, I'm not tired. You go. <laughs> I said, let's go. And I said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm having fun. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ed leaves angry and alone. Now police can only hope that somewhere in this bar they'll find a clue to the murder of Shirley Andronowicz. I got you. Oops. I got you. <laughs> Does anyone in the bar know anything about what happened later that night? Do they know who might have killed her? Could the murderer be amongst the drinkers who were watching her that night? What the police discover will shock and surprise the whole community. Early on Sunday morning, behind Grant Park High School in Winnipeg, Manitoba, the mutilated body of Shirley Andronowicz is found. Detectives investigating the murder try to find out everything they can about her, especially what happened during her last hours. How did she end up at the school when it's in the opposite direction to the bar? Did someone take her there? Oh, we absolutely felt it was uh, likely somebody from in the bar or, or one of her associates just based on, uh, 
on her lifestyle, but uh, we came up with nothing whatsoever. Shirley's body is taken to St. Boniface Hospital, where a post-mortem reveals even more disturbing evidence. The autopsy is conducted by Chief Medical Examiner, Dr. Peter Markestein. As the police suspected, Shirley was violently raped, but the attacker didn't stop there. On the abdomen, what appears to be a pattern, like a running shoe. Dr. Markestein finds some alarming marks on Shirley's body. What appears to be bite marks. Human bite marks. On the upper arm, the breasts, and the genitals. When we examined uh, the, the body and when we looked at the uh, nipples, that, that was obvious that uh, they uh, had been uh, uh, bitten off. <laughs> Her nipples were bitten off, bite marks were left on the body. Uh, there was extreme violence uh, uh, that was evident on the body. Uh, a piece of concrete curbing had been smashed into her face, basically obliterating her face. Uh, pants had been pulled down. It, it had all the earmarks of a vicious, vicious, vicious sexual attack. Dr. Markestein takes swabs of any saliva residue left around the bite marks. These are then sent to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Laboratory for testing. Together with the actual bite marks, the saliva may help identify the killer. If there is presence of saliva, in those days, what we did, now we would do DNA. In those days, we determined if the person were a secretor, that is, if they were to secrete their blood groups into their body fluids, uh, it would be possible to match that uh, with the uh, uh, accused or with the assailant. Severe bruising around the victim's neck, consistent with the purse strap found around the victim's neck. <laughs> It's hard to determine whether Shirley Andronowicz died from strangulation or from the repeated blows with a heavy object which crushed her skull. The sequence, of course, is more likely that the strangulation took place before the head was destroyed, uh, but I cannot say whether she was dead or in other. She probably was unconscious. The destruction of the head was, of course, overwhelming, and uh, we reached the conclusion that that was the cause of death in this particular case. The victim's blood and hair found on the heavy piece of concrete by the body confirms that this is the murder weapon. Now the forensic team must find out if the concrete holds any clues to the killer's identity. The murder weapon is given to forensic geologist Richard Monroe. Getting fingerprints from a surface can be extremely difficult or extremely easy depending on the medium. Every type of surface will react differently to the chemistry that's contained within the oils in your hands. If you're touching glass, you have a smooth surface and your fingerprints will sit on that surface. It'll give you a nice uh, consistent pattern. When you're dealing with a porous medium like a piece of concrete, uh, the surface is actually very bumpy and it will absorb the oils. Looked at microscopically, concrete resembles a series of sharp ridges. Any oils left by a finger would be balancing precariously on top of these points. In 1990, no one had yet been able to get fingerprints off concrete. The concept at the time was it was virtually impossible to get fingerprints on a porous medium. The technology didn't exist to be able to do that. A substance had to be found that would fix the fingerprint oils to the concrete ridges so they could then be treated with chemicals to make them stand out and become visible. Meanwhile, police try to piece together what happened during the last hours of Shirley's life. They round up the man she was dancing with, Randy Sloan, and his friends Richard St. Germain and Ron Sutherland. Detectives Bob Marshall and Ron Oliver interview them and everyone else they can find who was at the bar that night. We were having a good time. She was warming up. I told her my wife was at a hen party and her old man was passed out at home. I said, you know, why not come to my house, watch a movie, have a few beers? We were just dancing, you know. But Randy, I told him to ease off because she was married. Randy told him to get lost. And Ron said, if you say it again, I'll break your arm. So I said, Ron, just go sit back down. 
So about 11 o'clock, I figured I'd had enough, and I asked Shirley if she wanted to come home with me. She said no. Too bad, if she'd be here today. I have no idea when I left, but I went home alone. I just kept drinking, so I don't really remember too well what happened after that. Each of the men claim they left the bar alone. None of them have any idea who might have killed Shirley. After interviewing all the witnesses they can dig up, the detectives can find no one who saw Shirley leave the bar that night. Two days after the murder, police ask Ed Andronowicz to come up and tie up some loose ends. Robbery still figures as a possible motive for the attack. There's a number of unanswered questions. For example, uh, she wasn't wearing wedding rings, so did she have them? Were they missing? Her purse had been gone through, so no sign of credit cards. Did she have any? No, we don't have no credit cards. Who needs the debt, eh? Marshall then shows Ed the grocery list they found in the parking lot near the crime scene. It includes cat food and litter. The Andronowiches only have pet fish. That's not her writing. As the detectives wrap up the interview, Marshall suddenly asks the question that turns the investigation upside down. So, Ed, do you have any idea who might have killed your wife? I might have. What do you mean, you might have? I'm not sure. I can't remember. Are you saying that you might have killed your wife? It's possible. Ed, before we go any further, we want you to understand that you could be charged with murder. I know. So, what makes you think that you killed your wife? I hit her. Shirley came home from the bar. It was late, after midnight, and we got into a fight. A bad one. Where have you been? I'm yellow. Come on. Well, let's go to oh, bed. Oh, let go of me. I'm sleeping on the couch. Who have you been with, you dirty slut? <laughs> Me. You disgust me! I swear I... Oh, I'm... yeah. Come on. Come on, Troy. Come on, hit me! You're pathetic. She hit me. She dared me to hit her back. I hit her. She fell. Then what happened? She... She didn't move. So what did you do? I guess I, I... I put her into the car. What do you mean, you guess? I, I did. She was unconscious. Why? I thought she was dead. Where did you take her? I guess I... I took her to the school. I remember a field. Bleachers. Then what happened? I, I, I don't know. Why can't you remember? I'd been drinking. Lot. So what did you do? I'm not sure. I might have hit her. With what? A board? Did you bite her, Ed? I might have. Ed, we don't want you admitting to something you didn't do. Are you sure you killed your wife? Yes. I did. Ed's confession gives detectives their first definite suspect, but it raises more questions than it answers. We were uneasy with uh, the confession by virtue of the fact that there was nothing to corroborate it that we could find anyways. So we didn't charge him initially with the offense. We thought, well, we'll hold him for investigative purposes.
The police must now prove whether Ed killed his wife or not. If they get it wrong, they will lose any advantage they have and the murderer could strike again. The next day, detectives talk to Ed's daughter. She tells them that the day after the murder, her father gave her a bag of dirty clothes to wash. They had this smell to them. I don't know what kind of smell, okay? It's hard to describe. There were these, these dark stains, like blood. I don't know. I got scared, and I don't want to think he, he did it. She also tells he police that her parents had regular fights. Anger. Hey, she's sleeping on the couch. <laughs> She would slap him and, and pull his hair and, you know, he never fought back. They, um, you know, they had separate rooms. I don't want to believe he did it. Maybe. You know, when, you, when you've got all that anger and frustration built up inside you, it, it just explodes. The detectives see some of Ed's and Shirley's shoes. One of them matches the white canvas slip-on found at the crime scene. On the abdomen, what appears... But none of them match the print left on Shirley's body. If Ed is the killer, whose shoe left that mark? Police have Ed's confession and his daughter's potentially damaging testimony. They now take a blood sample to compare to the blood type found in the saliva on Shirley's bite marks. The results could seal Ed's fate. Forensic officers, meanwhile, continue their painstaking search for any evidence that might support Ed's confession. They measure the tire tracks found at the crime scene and compare them to those of Ed's car. They are similar but inconclusive. The inside of Ed's car is examined too. If he did use it to take Shirley to the school, there should be some evidence left inside it. In the trunk, they find a windshield wiper pushed deep into the liner. The blade is badly damaged. The piece of concrete used to kill Shirley Andronowicz also had a black mark on it, like the shape of a wiper blade. Did Ed have the murder weapon in the trunk of his car? Many small pieces of concrete were also found, which isn't unusual given that Ed works in construction, but could they be from the block that killed Shirley? They are sent to forensic geologist Richard Monroe for analysis. There were several faces in that trunk, and we tried to go over the whole block on either side to see if there was actually a physical match. There was a lot of time invested trying to put that block in that vehicle. Monroe even goes so far as to visit the crime scene. Part of doing an investigation is understanding what you're looking at totally. You don't just zero in on one small aspect, you have to take a look at the whole picture, seeing what a potential witness might see, what a witness might hear, a noise of a bus going by, or whatever it might be. Monroe then notices the parking lot a couple of hundred feet away. Taking a closer look, he makes a crucial discovery. I looked at the pieces in the parking lot and I saw some obvious um, comparatives with the parking lot abutment that was used as the murder weapon, the way the block was broken at, at the time, I thought that could be a fit. The murder weapon did not come from Ed's car. It had been at the crime scene all along. Having found where the murder weapon came from, Monroe gets the company that manufactured it to make him an exact replica. 
He cuts that into small sections so he can conduct a variety of experiments to try to read fingerprints on concrete. Inventing a new science is a long, meticulous process. There wasn't a day I didn't work on it, um, and it was pretty intense, 18, 20 hours a day sometimes, just to be able to get through it. If Ed's fingerprints are found on the concrete block, he faces life in prison for the murder of his wife. His future could now depend on Monroe doing something no one has yet been able to do. Shirley Andronowicz, a middle-aged mother of three, was brutally raped and murdered behind this suburban school in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Her husband, Ed, has confessed to the crime. Though police have their doubts, forensic investigators search for clues that will support his confession. Officer Kerry Armit discovers two fingerprints on the grocery list he found in the parking lot near the crime scene. We can see the two areas on the back of the grocery note where these fingerprints were developed. We thought they may be identifiable if we had a suspect um, ink impressions to, to use in comparison, so uh, they were compared to many suspects annually. The prints are clear enough to establish that they don't belong to Ed or to his murdered wife, Shirley. Perhaps this harmless list has nothing to do with the case after all. The forensic investigators leave no avenue unexplored. Anything the killer touched could help to identify him, even the bite marks he left on Shirley's body. An impression of Ed's bite is made in wax so it can be analyzed. Dr. David Sweet is the director of the Bureau of Legal Dentistry at the University of British Columbia. There are a variety of crucial questions that can be answered in criminal investigations and they are centered around dental evidence. In the case of a bite mark, if you identify the bite mark, you're able to conclude who created that bite mark and that becomes a very important issue for the police. Dr. Sweet traces the wax impressions of Ed's bite onto a piece of acetate. He then superimposes that on a life-size photograph of one of Shirley's bite marks. This method allows him to move the position of the teeth around so as to compare them to the marks on the skin. When I did this comparison, I didn't see the type of match that I thought would be there if, in fact, these teeth caused the bite mark. I was able to conclude that this suspect could be excluded as the biter. This is a major turning point in the investigation. Ed is not the one who left those bite marks on his wife. <coughs> and then the final piece of evidence. The results of the saliva analysis come back from the lab. Now the investigation takes another dramatic turn. The saliva was from a person who is a so-called secretor. And by that, I mean they secrete blood factors in their saliva. Shirley's murderer had B-type blood factors in his saliva. Only 6% of the population fit this profile. And Ed Andronowicz is not one of them. Ed's shoes don't match the print left on Shirley's body. There was no evidence Ed had transported her in his car. Ed's teeth don't match the bite marks on Shirley's body. And the killer has type B blood. Ed does not. After 56 days in jail, Ed is finally released. The police are baffled. If he didn't murder his wife, why did he confess to it? Uh, Ed Adronowicz confessed to the crime because he genuinely believed that he may have committed the offense. Um, he knew that he'd been having trouble with his wife. He knew he'd been in a fight with her. Uh, he knew that she was dead, and he had no explanation, so it's kind of like, who else but him could have done it? It was a true whodunit murder case. It may have started out looking like a potential domestic assault, but in fact, uh, that particular theory was proved uh, to be wrong, and there was some 
person out there who had committed this horrible act and possibly may commit another similar offense. <laughs> it's now two months since the night Shirley Andronowicz was murdered. The police still have no suspect or any clue as to the identity of her killer. I'm tired. Let's go. Oh, I'm not tired. You go. <laughs> I said, let's go. And I said, I don't want to go. I'm having fun. <laughs> Detectives still believe her murderer was in the bar that night, probably watching this scene. Could it have triggered the rage that climaxed in the savage rape and murder of Shirley Andronowicz? <laughs> now, two months later, the early advantage has been lost and a psychopath is still at large. He could strike again at any time. <laughs> Detectives now try to find if anyone else who was in the bar that night has type B blood to match the secretion and the bite marks on Shirley's body. Some samples are positive, but with no other evidence to point a definite finger at anyone, this is another blind alley. Investigators become demoralized because you can't help but have empathy for this victim and their family. Then police get the break they've been hoping for. Working on his test slabs, forensic geologist Richard Monroe has found a way to preserve and identify fingerprints left on concrete. After a lot of trial and error, uh, it was determined that cyanacrylate or superglue uh, was the best fixing material to try to hold the oils in your hands on the concrete surface. Monroe now tries his test on the murder weapon. He flushes it with a chemical called Sudan Black. Its particles get caught up in the fingerprint ridges fixed by the glue, making them visible. Uh, when you watch the, the prints develop, it's like watching a flower bloom. It was a very personal moment. I left the lab and I walked out to the major crime area to talk to the detectives and found out I was the only one there. Everybody had gone home. So, it was rather anticlimactic because you finally made a discovery that no one had tell. After three months' work, Monroe does find fingerprints on the murder weapon, but they're too badly smudged to be of use. It's a frantic event, so you get slippage, but at least you could tell how it was held, and that was the best we could get out of the situation based on what the crime scene gave us. The blurry image can't bring the police any closer. The investigation once again hits a dead end. Then, on August 17th, a shocking piece of news. 16-year-old Bridget Grenier is found murdered less than 50 miles from Winnipeg. It happened in June, a month after the murder of Shirley Andronowicz. There are awful similarities between the two cases. Both women were beaten, raped, and bitten. It's definitely someone that's on the, uh, the dark side of, of life that committed this offense. The man charged with Grenier's murder is one Kyle Unger. Intriguingly, the name Unger appears in Shirley Andronowicz's address book. Since most murderers are known to the victim, it gives police new hope and a new direction. The similarities between the two crimes are compelling. Police also find that Unger had been in Winnipeg around the time of Shirley's murder. Could the same man have killed both women? Detectives once again review all the available evidence to try and make the vital connection. But then, checking airline records, they discover that although Kyle Unger was in Winnipeg in May of 1990, he left the city a few days before the murder. He never returned. And the Unger and Shirley Andronowicz's address book is an uncle she hadn't seen in years. He is no relation to Kyle Unger. The two murders, though bizarrely similar, have nothing to do with each other. The case begins to crumble. We were carrying on with the investigation. We were chasing down a number of leads. Uh, however, none of those leads bore any fruit and, and the case was starting to grow a little bit cold. 
Winnipeg police now ask Inspector Ron McKay of the RCMP Violent Crime Analysis Section to put together a profile of the killer. The body was found in a totally exposed area, uh, which makes it a very high-risk crime for the offender. Risk of, of interruption, risk of being seen. Uh, this was a highly impulsive crime and a highly opportunistic crime. When you have this kind of crime, typically the offender will live or work in the immediate area. And the demographics of the area suggest that the majority of residents, particularly male residents, in that area are Caucasian. The bite marks on the victim uh, were motivated by a violent sexual fantasy that the offender has been carrying around in his, in his brain for years. And the sexual behavior was suggestive of a youthful offender. Uh, and the, the, the choice of weapon certainly suggests that you have a, a very powerful a uh, physically strong offender with a sustained high level of anger. The profile was potentially very useful, but with no suspects, it was academic. As the months drag on, police need a real break if they are going to catch the killer. On the first anniversary of the murder, a TV report is broadcast to jog people's memories. The early morning hours of Sunday, May 20th, 1990, Shirley Andronowicz's beaten body was found behind Grant Park High School. Even though the case is now more than a year old, police say the investigation still continues, though they don't expect anyone else to be charged. Unsolved murder, the case is never closed. It may, this investigation may be suspended to a degree, and then when new information comes in, of course, it's automatically reopened. And then, as a result of the broadcast, a totally unexpected break. We got a telephone call from an individual who felt that he may have some information. <laughs> the tip-off comes from one Al Ryder. On the night of the murder, he and a friend, Mark Jarman, were also drinking at the Grant Hotel. No one knew them in the bar, so the police couldn't talk to them when they conducted their interviews a year ago. Man, it's late. I'm checking out. See you back at the apartment. OK. See you later. Ryder and Jarman were both staying with a friend nearby. The apartment overlooked the field behind Grant Park High School, the scene of the murder. Hey, what's up? When Ryder returns to the apartment, he finds Jarman visibly shaken. What's up with you, Mark? This guy. He tried to rob me. What happened? I fought him off. I hit him on the head. With a cinder block. I think I killed him. You killed him? You sure, man? Yeah. I think so. What do I do with these, man? Shh. Jarman burnt the clothes, and Ryder didn't think much more about it until he saw the report on Shirley's death a year oh. later. When Ryder makes the call, Jarman is already in prison just outside Winnipeg, serving time for burglary. Ryder's story gives police a new direction in this difficult case. Could this petty thief be the vicious murderer of Shirley Andronowicz? The first sign that the story could have some substance comes from the seemingly innocent grocery list Carrie Armit found near the crime scene the day after the murder. It has two clear fingerprints on it. It turns out that the day before the murder, the mother of the friend with whom Jarman was staying asked him to get some groceries for her. She gave him a hundred dollars. Jarman left her the change with the groceries. She was the owner of a cat. As Jarman is already in prison, his fingerprints are on file. Armit compares them to the prints he found on the grocery list. Two fingerprints on the grocery note were identified, one having been made by Mr. Jarman's left thumb and one by his left middle finger. 
there was enough detail to positively identify him as having made these fingerprints. All right. But Marshall knows All that right. a print on a grocery list found in a busy right. public area won't tie Jarman to the murder, especially when the place he was staying was so near the crime scene. 20 hours after Ryder's phone call, the detectives go to interview Jarman in prison. We tried to be as well armed as possible before going into an interview of this magnitude uh, for a crime of this seriousness. There's a lot riding on this interview. It's been over a year since the murder and the police haven't charged anyone yet. But for the first time in the investigation, Marshall and Oliver feel optimistic, and Jarman appears to want to talk. And I met up with the woman. We got talking. She, she was looking for her shoe, she said. She'd lost her shoe. One of the things that solidified the case for us was uh, when he first began speaking with her, she had said that she was out looking for a shoe. And we knew we were onto the right track at that time because there was a shoe found with the body and the matching shoe was found back at her house. Tell us about it. We had sex. That was it. Then I got into a fight with this guy. He tried to rob me. We had a fight. That's how I got the blood on me. What about the woman? She just headed off in the other direction. There was no other guy there, Mark. Okay, let's take a break. I'll be right back. Could he really be the vicious killer they've been hunting for over a year? You want me to solve this thing for you right now? The stuff about the guy. Bullshit. I did it. Okay? I did it. Well, Detective. Do I fit your profile? What's your profile say? Jarman then gives them a full confession. He admits to having sex with Shirley Andronowicz, but insists it was consensual, saying he only killed her when she accused him of rape. He wasn't going to prison for rape. Why did you bite her? I'm not sure why I did that. It's a chilling response for such a savage attack. The nipples themselves were never recovered and we asked him if he could help us out with that and, and, and in quite an insulted fashion, he did those places, well, I didn't keep them or anything like that. Marshall has already had one confession in this case. He's all too aware that without solid evidence, Jarman's story may not stand up in court. Mark Jarman has confessed to the murder of Shirley Andronowicz. The forensic team must now put together a solid case with which to convict him. 
David Sweet, the expert in legal dentistry, gets to work on the impressions of Jarman's teeth. His teeth had uh, spaces between them, and they tapered toward the biting edge. That kind of detail becomes important when we do the physical comparison of the teeth to the bite mark. Though the first teeth marks he tries to match on Shirley's skin aren't clear enough, there are others which do provide an incriminating match. The bite marks on the nipples had very little information because of the damage to the skin. So the primary area where this uh, conclusion um, was presented to the courts was with the bite to the genital area. That way, I was able to identify the person that was responsible for the crime. That is the best news the police could have hoped for. Mark Jarman finally stands trial for the murder of Shirley Andronowicz, but there are still surprises in store. Mr. Andronowicz, why did you confess to killing your wife? I, uh, I could have killed her. I, I don't really remember. You don't remember killing your wife? We, uh, I, I was drinking a lot then. Um, we had a lot of bad fights. I, I might have, you know, done it, like by accident. I don't really know. You don't know. Though he's only a witness at Jarman's trial, Ed's battle with his inner demons makes him think he's the guilty party. Terry McKean was the Crown Attorney prosecuting the case. Well, it was a tough case because of the fact that the, the husband had already confessed to the murder, so throughout the whole course of the trial, I was busy not only showing that Jarman was the real killer, but I was busy defending the husband and showing that he wasn't the killer. Jarman's conviction is sealed by the forensic evidence painstakingly gathered by the Winnipeg police. Jarman's teeth match the bite marks on Shirley's body. Jarman's blood type matches the blood secretions in the saliva left on Shirley's body. Jarman's fingerprints match the fingerprints found on the grocery list. And in his statement to the police, Jarman said a number of things that only the real killer could know. So there were many, many things that identified him as the person that committed this unbelievably brutal murder. After a four-week trial, Mark Jarman is found guilty of murder. For the police involved in this case, the forensic evidence does more than convict Jarman. It also paints a clearer picture of what really happened that night behind Grant Park High School. Of, of the whole attack uh, just didn't sit well as far as uh, being consensual. This was a rape, without a doubt. Jarman thought, well, rather than get arrested, charged, and locked up in jail as a rapist, uh, I'd better kill her, basically save myself that trouble. And there, in the parking lot, he found the perfect weapon to silence Shirley for good.
15 years after uh, having done this case, what sticks in my mind is the absolute brutality of this murder and sexual mutilation. It's uh, unlike any other case I've ever done, and I've done a few murder cases. I found the Andronowicz case to be a, a, a hugely tragic case uh, and, and extremely challenging in that there was so many uh, different uh, parts of our training that we had to put to use. With all the answers the evidence provided, there is one that may never be known. Why, even with the real killer on trial, did Ed Andronowicz still think he might have murdered his wife? Perhaps it's, you know, a way of salvaging a, a life that's going nowhere and get some redemption for something. Maybe he feels responsible for having her out walking around in the middle of the night, and in that way he feels he, he killed her.